mentioned, or I mentioned rather, uh, some of the healings that Jesus had had needed to take them into the 21st century, but not to lose the very root of the fact that we are connected to the teachings of Jesus, to the Spirit of God, and so far, 2,000 years after those particular events. This morning I'd like to focus on the second part of our reading, about Jesus going to a solitary place, to a quiet place. Of course there are many examples of that in the Gospels, of Jesus going into the wilderness, or Jesus going to a mountain, and each time it's always associated with him making a connection, a connection with God, who he calls Father, Abba Father, as mentioned in the Gospels. And that particular way of being in the Lord, of moving from activity to reflection, from doing the things that we are designed and made to do, to a time of quietness, a time of calmness. It seems rather counterintuitive, but it's important in order that one can act in a reasonable way, in a thoughtful way, to have time away from action, to have time of quietness in some particular place that you find. There's no prescription for when one should spend time. Of course, I know in the passages it's often at dawn or at dusk, and they seem to be tend to be good times when we can find quietness and stillness. But it doesn't matter when. It's just a matter of knowing that our life moves between the mood of quietness, of solitude, and the mood of activity and action. Don't give up the action so that you sit in a chair all day and do nothing, it must feed what we do and how we act in this world. But it's drawn deeply from our Christian faith. Now often we see Christian faith as, as a set of beliefs in a whole range of different ways, a moral code, or we see it as something that one should do. So people will say things like, well, that's not very Christian so forth. So it's a moral kind of thing or a set of beliefs or an activist religion where we are to find a new world order and justice. Well, it's all of those things. But what has often been lost, I would suppose particularly in our Protestant tradition, has been that the Christian faith is also a contemplative faith. It's an opportunity to touch the deeper things in life. Beliefs, yes, but they must lead us into that which is beyond. The story is told of a young man who comes to Mahatma Gandhi. And he says, I want to be a Hindu. Gandhi looked at the keen new convert and he said to him, go back to your own faith and find what you're looking for there. Christianity has a deep, contemplative, prayerful basis and source. And it's important that we mine that, that we go back and find that which can give our hearts, our lives, our minds, our bodies, what we need in order to live a full life, as Jesus has said. So solitude is a part of it. For years and years... Christians have practised uh, prayer, solitude, contemplation, and a whole range of other ways of moving beyond the active life so that the active life is shaped and formed by our spirit, by that which is deep within us. The emphasis in many of the movements in Christianity have arisen not just out of activity or activism, but have been moved out of prayer and consideration in people's uh, particular life. So, we can argue that there is often within ourselves a kind of a turmoil, or rather it's a cacophony of different sounds of, well, I should do this, I should do that. What's the best way to deal with that? Is it to write a list? Well, sometimes to try to get that stillness. Often it's just a matter of sitting still. Blaise Pascal, 
famous philosopher and uh, mathematician of the 18th century, said that most of the problems in this world could be solved if people could learn to sit quietly in a room. I can remember, and I won't mention which one of my children it was, but I remember coming home once at about 4.30 or 5 in the afternoon and as I walked into the living room, the radio was on or the stereo was on. I walked through the house into the family room and the TV was on. And I walked into the next room and my son's... Uh oh I just gave it away there. There's got two sons. <laughs> His stereo was going too. And where was he? He was in the backyard throwing a basketball. But there was a sense in which he almost walked into the house turning on these sounds as he went through. And of course, we do it in our own way as well. But sometimes the stillness, and as was mentioned in the nine o'clock service, sometimes we can be fearful of that stillness because we're not doing anything. And it can actually be something that can be a little bit frightening and we just don't know what we should do. So there needs to be a practice, a practice of prayer, a practice of contemplation, a practice of solitude. Conversations that we have with one another should be fed, not by our activity so much, but by the fact that we have had stillness and quiet so that we can learn to listen to one another. I have a terrible habit of forming my comment before the person has finished their particular speech. And it's better to listen to what someone says, to be still, be quiet, and then after that to respond to what they said rather than what I want to say. And I'm glad to say I'm not the only person who does that. But it is a way in which we can practice a deeper solitude and we can hear what that person is saying. It may be something that is very important to them or it may be just part of a conversation. But we're able to know what that is when there is stillness in our being. Wonderful insights and lessons can come to us even when we're just sitting and breathing and thinking really about nothing but our breathing. And just listening, not necessarily to words that may come from God or from where else, but the sensation of being in the presence of. That's part of the definition of contemplation itself, to be present to and to be in the presence of. To be present to and to be in the presence of. Do you ever know what it's like to be with somebody and they are not present to you? Well, I find that with the uh, little grandchildren, the five-year-olds. They can very easily be living in their own world. Dinner time, dinner time. They are not present to the words that I'm saying. But we even do it as adults. We are not present to that person. But when we are, it can be a wonderful experience for both people. Simone Weil, the great uh, French philosopher, said that the greatest gift you can give to another person is your undivided attention. So if we extrapolate that onto the, the world of, of Christian theology, it is God who gives us God's greatest potential and, of course, gives us undivided attention. And that is what feeds us, nurtures us and nourishes us in our relationships with others around the world. But there needs to be stillness. It has to come out of that, that which is beautiful music as well, can do that for us. Thank you. So let me just say a little story about stillness. There was once a mechanic who was removing a cylinder head from the motorcycle and he spotted a well-known cardiologist in his shop. The cardiologist was there waiting for the service manager to come and take a look at his car. When the mechanic shouted across the garage, hey doc, want to come and take a look at this? The cardiologist was a bit surprised, but he walked over to where the mechanic was working on the motorcycle. The mechanic straightened up and wiped his hands on a rag and asked, so doc, look at this engine. 
I opened its heart, took the valves out, repaired any damage, and then put it back together again when I was finished, and it works like it's brand new. So tell me, how come you make 100,000 a year? This is an old story. I think cardiologists probably make a little more than that these days. How come you make all this money every year? And you and I really doing the same job. The cardiologist paused, smiled, leaned over and whispered to the mechanic, try doing it while the engine is still running. See, we do need that stillness at times in order to enter into the activity. To renew the centre of our lives, we need at times to turn off the engine or at least to turn it down to move from the energy that's pouring into our lives to an energy that we can't see, that's invisible, that's beyond us and yet also fits us for the life that we must live. Some years ago I was sitting in my office in Canada and the treasurer of the church, who came once a month and would present me with my monthly paycheck, he came, knocked on the door and came into the office and a uh, delightful man, and uh, we had many conversations. And I was sitting in a big chair, one like over my office, and I was reading a book. And uh, he said to me, oh, you haven't got anything to do today. Now, he was being very nice and making a bit of a joke, but there is an interesting thing within our own lives that if we're not doing something that is activity. Now obviously reading a book is an activity, but if we're not sort of moving out and connecting and whatever, that we're not doing anything. We're not actually doing something of value and importance. And yet we know that our activity will be far more effective if we have thought about it and reflected on it in prayer and in what I've called contemplation. So that sense needs to be woven into the very fabric of our lives. We need not to be fearful of being alone, nor being in the presence of God, nor being present to the spirit that comes into our life. Yes, there may be thoughts that ramble around. Some of them can be not very helpful thoughts. So we need to practice. Practice our prayer in a way that stills the very centre of our lives. I uh, wrote a number of poems for Lent last year. I think I wrote them the year before, but they were going to be distributed last year. Unfortunately, of course, COVID meant that that couldn't happen and they're sitting in my office, about 50 copies of these prayers for each day in Lent, uh, actually they're poems for each day in Lent. And I can remember when I started this, I was a bit fearful of writing this because I was going to go out to the congregation and so forth. And I deliberately sat there and I turned off my inner critic. I said, thank you. Thank you, inner critic. You've been very helpful me in my life, but I really don't need you now. Because I knew that if I started to criticise in my mind what I was writing, I would keep on hitting speed bumps all the way through. I just had to put it down on paper and write. And whatever came out, came out didn't have to necessarily hand out everything, I could leave things out later, but at the time of writing, I needed that flow, that flow of energy, that flow of life, and that could only happen if I got out of the way. And that's very much what happens in prayer. There's a sense in which I get out of the way and I allow the Spirit of God to shape and form my life. So, all of us, of course, need the same kind of way of being in prayer. And finding that, as Jesus has said, by going into a solitary place and there he was able to commune with the living God who he called Father. And it could be a fantastic experience when we touch that living God and know that that living God has touched us. Amen. Let us pray.
We thank you, God, for the gifts that have come into our lives, for the opportunity to give to those who are near, but also those who are far away. We thank you for the ministry of this church that is willing to share its wealth among those in the world, in this neighbourhood and within this community that we might all live more fully through Christ our Lord. We are grateful that you are the source of life, of love and wisdom. And we bring to this moment and this place our hopes and dreams, our needs and desires and even our struggles and disappointments. For we seek strength each day and the support for our life's journey. We are reminded that in still and quiet moments, we are blessed by those who love and care for us and that there is nothing in the entire universe that can separate us from your love which we have experienced in our relationship with the living spirit of Jesus. So expand our souls, we pray. May we have the courage to challenge all that limits and debilitates us, all that causes pain within our circle of friends and loved ones, and all that contributes to the lessening of life within our world. May we be forgiven for our participation in the evils of this world that we deplore. So loving God, we gather together in this circle of care and compassion and prayer, those we care for. We pray for Annette Davies, as Graham Davies died yesterday. We thank you that Annette has been such a faithful member of our nine o'clock worship group. And we do pray for her in the days and weeks and months ahead that she should know the peace of Christ that passes all understanding. And in this moment of silence, we mention the names of those in need of prayer. And we pray for those who have had a difficult week, whether it is through illness, loneliness, accident or personal struggle, may they know the spirit of resilience and encouragement. So loving God, we affirm that we are shaped and reshaped by the power of your spirit alive in our world. We seek not so much to have all of our wishes and desires met, but rather to participate more fully in the life of this world and to see more clearly the coming of healing, hope, peace and justice. In your world we pray. Amen.